course, from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You are at war with the devil. You have no choice in this war. He has declared war on you. He has declared war on all of God's creation. Since you are created, he has declared war on you. He has declared war on you, not only because you are created, but in particular, because you are created in the image of God. You have no alternative but to fight this battle. The devil uses a two-fold attack when he makes war on you. First, he tempts you, and second, he accuses you. When the devil tempts you, he lies to you. He knows that if you are grounded upon the truth of God, you will never sin. In order to tempt you, he must replace the truth of God with something else. The only thing that he can replace the truth of God with is a lie. And so he lies to you. He lies to you about the existence of God. He lies to you about the nature of God. He lies to you about the judgments of God. He either makes God seem more severe than he is so that God appears as a tyrant against whom it would be just to rebel. Or he makes the judgments of God seem milder than they are so that it really won't matter when you sin. He lies about the things in the world, and he lies about the nature of the things in the world. He lies about your own nature, so that his temptations will entice you to sin. Behind every temptation stands a demon. Behind all of your neighbor's wealth, the things that he has, the vacations that he takes, the wife to whom he is married, stands a demon tempting you to covet. Behind every anger and hateful thought stands a demon tempting you to bear that grudge and to refuse to forgive. Behind every lustful image and the authority of your parents stands the demon tempting you to disobey your parents and to entertain that lustful thought. Behind God's own authority stands a demon tempting you to believe something else to trust and fear and love something else other than God. The demons are everywhere. There are hordes of them, and you must do battle with them. You have no alternative. If the devil convinces you to sin, he turns right around and accuses you of it. The devil is a hypocrite. He has been a liar from the beginning. When he is tempting you to sin, he pretends to be your friend. He pretends to have your best interests at heart. And then when you have gone and violated God's word, he turns right around and accuses you of it. The word devil means slanderer. He slanders you before God. The word Satan means accuser or adversary. He accuses you before God. The devil will enter into your own conscience and parade your sins in front of you. He will not permit you to quit thinking about them. He does not want you to forget about them. God allows this accusation to take place because many times when the devil accuses you on the basis of God's law, the accusation is true. The devil has one of two goals for you. He wants you to either despair, or he wants you to be proud. He doesn't care which one you do, he's got you either way. When Satan accuses you, he would be delighted if you would despair of the grace of God. Most of us know that God can forgive anything. Most of us know that the grace of God extended to us in our Lord Jesus Christ can forgive anything. Where the devil wreaks havoc in our conscience is whether or not God will forgive us. And so he accuses us. He accuses us in order to convince us that we are really sorry for the things that we have done. That we have not 
shown appropriate repentance in our lives for what we have done and what we have been. He is trying to get you to despair that God will forgive you. He's trying to get you to doubt in the grace of God so that if you lose faith, He has you. But the devil is just as comfortable with pride as he is with despair. Some people, when they are faced with the accusations of the devil in their conscience, respond with their own righteousness. In the face of their sins, they point out to the devil and God all of the righteous things that they have done. Look at me. I'm not so bad. Look at the righteous things that I have done. Look at all of these other people who are far worse than me. And the devil will supply you with all kinds of people in politics and among the celebrities who seem far worse than anything you have done. The devil doesn't care which way you go. Despair or pride. Rely upon your own righteousness or despair of the grace of God. Either way, you're thinking about yourself and not God. And the devil has you. He has won the war. So if you are going to fight this battle, you are going to need to take up the full armor of God. Do not take up part of the armor of God or a couple of pieces of the armor of God. Take up the full armor of God. And the first piece of the armor of God is the belt of truth. I'm not for sure why the ESV chose to translate it, the belt of truth. Probably because the original doesn't make any sense to Americans. But if you don't know the original, you don't know what God's getting at. So I'll just tell it to you. Gird your loins with the truth. You see, we Americans, when we think of loins, we think of pork loins or something like that. We don't use loins the same way they used loins 400 and 500 years ago. But that's what the Bible says. Gird your loins with the truth. God is talking about the undergarment of his armor. If a Roman soldier did not wear an undergarment to his armor, he could not protect himself from the hardness of the armor, and the armor would do harm to him rather than to protect him from his enemies. You have to put the undergarment on first. And so, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, all of the other armor that God gives you will not work unless it is grounded in the truth. The truth that comes from the mouth of God. Once your loins are girded with the truth, then take up the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is not the breastplate of our righteousness. How would our righteousness protect us from the accusations of the devil? The breastplate of righteousness about which God is speaking is the breastplate of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His righteousness is perfect. The devil can accuse him of nothing. And if you take up the breastplate of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the devil will be unable to accuse you. The breastplate protects your heart and your lungs. It protects your back. It keeps you alive. Here the example of Luther is instructed. Luther records that when the devil would come in his conscience and accuse him of all the things that he had done, Luther would respond to the devil by saying, You're right, devil, I have done all those things that you say I've done. And I've even done some things that you failed to mention. But I am baptized. And that's Luther's way of saying that he was wearing the breastplate of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If the devil cannot accuse Jesus Christ and you are wearing his righteousness, then the devil cannot accuse you. It protects you from the attacks and the assaults of Satan. Take up the shield of faith. The shield of faith which is able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the enemy. The flaming darts of the enemy are his accusations. The shield of faith believes what God has told it. And what has God told you? God has told you that your sins are all forgiven. Faith believes that. 
hearts because you believe that Christ died for you. You believe him when he says that your sins are forgiven. Put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. <coughs> There's a phrase that we use even in English. He talked the talk, but he didn't walk the walk. And when we use the word walk in this fashion, we mean the way that he lives his life. So when we say somebody talked the talk, but did not walk the walk, that means he did not live in accordance with his own words, and he is a hypocrite. So even in English, when we talk about walking around, we are talking about living our lives. And that's what God is talking about when he says, put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Without foot gear, the Roman soldier cannot go into battle and cross all of this rugged terrain. I can't even cross the church parking lot without foot gear. And so you put on your feet the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace with God. So that you may walk the walk. Folks, nothing is more paralyzing to the walk of your life than when the devil makes sure that his accusations against you become public. When people know about the sin that bothers you, and you know that they're all talking about it, it can be the most paralyzing thing of them all. How can you make decisions under these circumstances? What does the future hold for you when everyone is aware of what you did? It can be paralyzing. So put on your feet the shoes of the gospel of peace. If your sins are forgiven, you are at peace with God. If your sins are forgiven, there is no accusation against you. Let the world accuse you all at once. God will not accuse you. That's the gospel of peace. So that you may continue to live your life. So that you're not paralyzed by the accusation against your sin. So that you may walk the walk that God has given you to walk. I am privileged to be the pastor of a congregation with a lot of athletes in it. Many of you are athletic, and many of you were athletic. I am not an athlete, never were. Chess was my game. And at the tournaments, you knew this. If you play only a defensive game, you will lose. You must play an offensive game if you expect to win. Now, I'm not an athlete, but I've watched enough sporting events to know that that is true for sports as well. If a basketball team plays only a defensive game, they will lose. They must attack. They must play an offensive game if they expect to win. Football makes it obvious. Because you have your defensive positions and your offensive positions depending upon who has possession of the ball. So football makes it completely obvious that you must play an offensive game if you expect to win the fight. Volleyball looks like a defensive game when the girls are little because they're all trying to keep the ball from falling off the floor on their side of the net. But when the girls get older and they have some experience they can pass the ball and return it in such a way that the other team cannot respond. They call this a kill. Not even in football does anybody kill anybody. <laughs> but they do it in volleyball. You must play an offensive game if you want to win. And that is true of the war against the devil. All of the armaments that God has given you so far are all defensive. The shield, the breastplate, the helmet, the shoes. Unless you fight an offensive war against the devil, you are going to lose. So you must take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You must take the fight to the devil and fight him with the word of God. The word of God is God's offensive weapon against the devil, and with the word of God, you will win the victory. In order to use the Word of God, one must know the Word of God. So if you attend divine service only sporadically, you happen to be here this morning, 
Please attend more often so that you may learn the Word of God and employ it in your attacks against the devil. If you do not read the Bible on a daily basis, start reading the Bible on a daily basis. If you read only the devotion in the portals of prayer, start looking up the Bible passages in the corner that the portals of prayer gives you. And if you're already looking up the Bible passages in the portals of prayer, start reading the whole chapter that those passages are in. Or just lay that aside. Just read the Bible straight up. If you read a chapter a day, you can get through the Bible in three years. If you read three chapters a day, you can get through the Bible in one year. And when you read it, especially if you read it by yourself, read it aloud and read it slow. Did you know that Pastor Podal, yet to this day, is still at Pastor's conferences telling the joke, when did they put that in there? <laughs> he says that referring to things that he's never noticed in the Bible before. He has studied the Bible his entire life and he's still noticing new things. And you and I will be noticing new things when we read the scriptures. And the reason that is true is because the Bible is dense. It's not like picking up a book of fiction out of Barnes and Noble. It is dense. A lot is said in just a little bit of time. Read it slow. Read it aloud. Savor the words. Let them sink into your mind and sink into your heart. When I read the Bible by myself, I read it aloud. And sometimes it takes me three chapters just to quit thinking about all the work I have to do and all the stuff that I don't have done at home and all this other stuff before I can finally focus on it. Read it extensively. There's a pastor in the Missouri Synod who is memorizing all 150 psalms. <laughs> and he says, in order to learn a new one, I have to review all the old ones so I don't forget them. And when I review them over and over and over again, it's like the Holy Spirit is furrowing my brain. He puts tracks in my brain and it is changing how I think. And that's the key. When the Word of God is wielded in this fashion, when the sword of the Spirit is taken up against the assaults of the devil, the Word of God will recreate you and change the way that you think. And when your thinking is changed, the temptations of Satan lose their power. The accusations of Satan lose their power, and you obtain the victory. So take up the full armor of God. Take up all of it. The shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of the faith, the breastplate of righteousness. Adorn your loins with the truth and wield that sword of the Spirit against the devil. He will be defeated and the victory will be yours.